Good evening, friends, and welcome to the 2021 Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary Edwards Peacemaking Lecture Series. We are so happy that each of you have joined us. In just a moment, we will start the lecture with an opening prayer, followed by a brief introduction of our guest speaker. During the presentation, you might have some questions for the lecturer. We ask that you please place them in the chat and they will be addressed at the conclusion within her presentations. Let's place ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Loving God, we offer everything to you during this webinar. May we ask for your blessings and divine providence that the activity set for this undertaking be successful and effective. May we also retain the invaluable knowledge and learning experiences that we will derive from this activity. Your generous blessings will mean so much to us to have a successful webinar. We know that without it, we can do nothing. May we be a living witness to your general love, O oh God, through the implementation of the knowledge acquired through this activity. Grant now your divine wisdom as we go about our daily tasks after this webinar. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. This evening, we welcome the Reverend Dr. Elise Fulbright, who will continue the 2021 Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary Edwards Peacemaking Lecture Series. Dr. Fulbright's presentation will focus on African Americans' contribution to the United Methodist Church. I know that each of you received a short bio of Dr. Fulbright. However, please allow me to share just a few highlights about our awesome speaker. She currently serves as a conference superintendent in the Central District of the Indiana Conference of the United Methodist Church. Prior to this appointment, Dr. Fulbright served as the Director of Leadership Development for the Indiana Conference. She also served in the North Texas Conference in a host of ministry settings. And before entering full-time ministry in 2008, she was the assistant controller of the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to some and introduce to others the Reverend Dr. Elise Fulbright. God bless you, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. I am truly grateful for the opportunity to be here and to offer a presentation regarding the contributions of African-American persons to the United Methodist Movement. I'm grateful for Dr. Hauser for the invitation and our great host, Chris, who is doing a fabulous job and I'm so grateful for Louis, Louisville Presbyterian for this opportunity to share about the United Methodist witness, but more importantly, about the African American uh, contributions to it. So without further ado, we will get this party started. <clears throat> so throughout this conversation, they call it lecture, I call it a conversation. My hope is that it will offer information, and then also some opportunities for us to be in dialogue. I realize that in putting together a presentation over a very set period of time, I may lose some things, miss some things, create some gaps for people, and that was never my intention. My hope is that the information presented will be informative and that you will be more inspired about how we as African-American persons continue to contribute to the United Methodist movement. So we move on. So when I first became a United Methodist, it was back in 1999. And as I continue to 
champion for the brand of United Methodism, the ongoing question that I often get is, are there Black United Methodists? <laughs> and are there Black United Methodist churches? And so the answer to both is yes. And I will give, my hope is through this conversation, I will be able to give history, understanding that there are many uh, arms of the Methodist movement for which this uh, lecture series is being able to present and I will not rehearse those matters. But I will through the timeline be able to present some integral matters for which the United Methodist Church was birthed and being able to elevate the contributions of African-American persons. So are there Black United Methodists? Absolutely, I am one. And are there Black United Methodist churches? Yes, we are here. The United, the history of Black people in the Methodist movement. And so I'm not going to read all of these because again, the other lecturers throughout this uh, experience will be highlighting many of these facts and figures because the Methodist movement uh, and our contribution in it is a part of many of the expressions that you have already heard, the AME, AME Zion, and CME. Some notables is in 19, excuse me, 1758, John Wesley baptized two Negro slaves, at least one woman, thus setting the pattern for receiving people of color into the societies and the church. These two returned to Antigua to start the Methodist society in the new world. And then as you can see, and I'll give you opportunity to kind of read and we're gonna kind of move fast because through this history, because there's some real good stuff that we need to get to. 1784, the Christmas conference in Baltimore, which we have heard perhaps through the threads of the other Methodist expressions, founds the Methodist Episcopal Church among those riding out to the issue. The call for the conference is uh, Black Harry Hooser. Born a slave about 1750, Hooser receives a license to preach in 1785 and becomes one of the best preachers and most effective early circuit writers. In 1790, drawn by the Methodist Episcopal Church's anti-slavery stance, a Black, slave, and free make up 20% of the 57,631 American Methodists. I wanna move on down because we've heard about the birth of the African Methodist, uh, uh, excuse me, denomination with Richard Allen. And then we've also heard about the African American Episcopal Zion Church, their orientation and how it came to be. What I want to note is that in 1845, down here at the bottom of this particular slide, in a break along regional lines, the Methodist Episcopal Church South is formed in Louisville, Kentucky. 1866, a group of Black Methodists within the Methodist Episcopal Church South petitioned the General Conference for their orderly dismissal from that church. Of these, as you have heard uh, regarding the colored Methodists or what we know now as a Christian Methodist Episcopal Church was the birth. In 1920, and this is where it gets really interesting and the and, and, and our context for our contributions as United Methodists and Black persons in United Methodism, the Methodist Church elects Robert E. Jones and Matthew W. Clare Sr. as bishops. In 1939, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the Methodist Protestant Church unite to form the Methodist Church. This is where it gets interesting because in 1939, Blacks were segregated into a separate general central jurisdiction. And we're gonna unpack what that means. In 1939, Blacks were segregated into a separate central jurisdiction. So these three arms of the Methodist movement formed the Methodist church and yet Black persons they were welcomed in, but they were segregated out into what was called the central jurisdiction. In 1956, the General Conference meeting in Minneapolis, Minnesota adopts Amendment uh, 10, excuse me, 9, allowing transfer of churches and conferences out of the central jurisdiction into regional jurisdiction. So therefore in 1956, there were many black churches that were, didn't want to be a part of the central jurisdiction 
And so they made petitions and the general conference, which is the uh, decision-making body comprised of lay and clergy persons, non-clergy and clergy persons, is that the decision-making body of the United Methodist structure adopted the amendment allowing the transfer of churches and conferences out of the central jurisdiction into general jurisdictions. It is noted that between 1939 and 1960, once the central jurisdiction was created, Black Methodists endeavored to make it an effective organization. Its Episcopal leaders were outstanding, effective, and highly revered. Both clergy and lay, which is non-clergy leadership, developed and provided leadership for the whole denomination. So while they segregated out the Black persons into the central jurisdictions, the Black Methodists rose to the occasion of leadership, not only to ensure that the central jurisdiction was effective and fruitful, but they also lend themselves into what was known as the Methodist church at that time. The central jurisdiction became both beloved and a source of contention and embarrassment. And it was during this time around 1957 that the Methodist church in and of itself began understanding that they indeed were part of the continued problem that was happening in society related to segregation and the continuation of racism. And so understanding that they were intentional about creating the central jurisdiction, there had to be some decision-making about how do we fix the error of our ways. And so through a course of almost 10 years, 11 years of this conversation and continuing debates and embarrassment, but yet continuing to segregate Black Methodists within this Methodist movement, in 1968, the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren Church united to form the United Methodist Church. And that's what we know of as today. Since 1968, the United Methodist Church was created, was formed, and it is in continuation even through this day. One of the integral parts of this coming together as the United Methodist Church was to ensure that there was a plan that the central jurisdiction is abolished and formal segregation had ended. It's interesting to note that in the coming together of the, uh, of the United Methodist Church in 1968, there was a bishop, a black male, Roy C. Nichols, who was elected as the first black male bishop in this United Methodist Church. Friends, that's not a small feat because if you remember, these uh, was a dominant cultured uh, church for which they allowed Black persons in with the abolishment of the central jurisdiction. And it took, I would suggest, a very gutsy, courageous person to avail themselves to the role of episcopacy and not only avail themselves to that process, but to also be elected in a dominant culture faith community called the United Methodist Church. This Bishop Roy C. Nichols should be celebrated. Black Methodists for Church Renewal is organized, the General Commission on Religion and Race is formed, and who is now Bishop Woody White, retired, is the first African-American person to lead the United Methodist General Agency. And we'll talk about those agencies because it's because of the Black Methodists for Church Renewal, its organization, the General Commission on Religion and Race, is what continues to keep the heartbeat of the accountability for the United Methodist Church to ensure that not just Black contributions, but all persons of color are truly integrated into what it means to be United Methodists. It's interesting because in 1968, when everyone was uh, wanting to come together and everyone wanted to abolish, not everyone, but when the General Conference voted to abolish the central jurisdiction, it is noted that there were questions from Black Methodists about the newly formed United Methodist Church, as you can imagine. Questions similar to how would the Black lay and clergy be treated in predominantly white annual conferences? 
annual conferences are the regional makeup of churches throughout the United States and abroad. Questions around, would there be black district superintendents and other staff personnel? Could black elders, those who were ordained, be elected to the episcopacy in an overwhelmingly white jurisdictional structure? And how would fellowship and friendships be maintained as the merger scattered annual conferences throughout five jurisdictional conferences? Because again, even through the central jurisdiction structure, these Black Methodists formed together, rallied together, resourced together to ensure that everyone was equipped, that people were doing what was uh, their calling and being able to make an impact in the world. And now with the abolishment of the central jurisdiction and the integration of these Black churches in, in dominant culture society and this United Methodist Church, it began fracturing relationships and friendships. And many of the Black Methodists at that time began wondering, what are we going to do? So it's interesting that through all of this, the National Conference of Negro Methodists was held in February of 1968 in Cincinnati. And there was a great excitement as the stage was being set to create a Black caucus within the United Methodist Church. And at the adjournment of that meeting that emerged was the Black Methodist for Church Renewal, where the motto was declared, our time under God is now. Because see, these Black contribute, these persons, these Black persons could no longer sit on the sideline as being integrated into this dominant culture denomination and just believe that everyone was ready to welcome them. No, they rallied together to form a caucus to ensure that the denomination was accountable, not just in the bringing them in, but to make sure that they was resourced to move forward. And so these are a series of two uh, short videos that I would like to show about the history. <laughs> came out of St. George Episcopal Church and the name Mother is significant because we birthed five other churches. For 220 years, Mother African Zor United Methodist Church has nurtured her community. Zor served African Americans in Philadelphia as a stop on the Underground Railroad. It was the first well baby clinic for African Americans, a school, and a source of credit for home loans. We have a long history of being conscious of educational needs, social needs, and the economic development of our community. Betty Henderson is a lay leader and the church's chief historian. Francis Asbury did the service of institutionalizing or forming of Zor. The early pastors were assigned to Zor through St. George. Uh, good morning to you all then. The story started in 1787. The Move now. African American members of St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church were forced apart from the white congregation and tensions flared. A little more than 200 years ago, Ms. Yellen and this very church from which the walls, floors, we're crafted with our own hands. We were humiliated. The rift led some to leave. Others, like those who would later start Mother Zor, stayed because of the denomination's support for the abolition of slavery and its commitment to ministering to the marginalized. We were the remnant that remained and stayed within the fold of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Tindley Temple United Methodist is a proud child of Mother Zor. The Reverend Robert Johnson says his congregation respects those who persevered. We call it the Mother Church or Mother's House because those were the ones who really started the African American movement and empowerment. We've never left. It's kind of strange to me that even now we're sitting in a product of the folk who stayed. And because we stayed, this was built. One God, 
As with all historic churches, over two centuries, Mother Zor has seen times of decline and of renaissance, but her presence remains a comfort to her community. Even though people are not coming to institutional churches as they did, it is still key to bring a community together. And if something goes wrong, the first place they come is to the church. It's still vital in the African-American community. So here's another one that explains its history. Methodist preacher Charles Albert Tinley is credited with writing lyrics in 1901 that are now part of one of the most famous songs in American history. Blacks and whites and Jews and Catholics all stood across this country in the 60s singing, We Shall Overcome. I'm not even understanding that the universal language they were singing came from a man who built the church right here on Broad Street in Philadelphia. Wow. Now, if you want to talk about being proud to be Methodist, that's a reason to be proud to be Methodist. The Reverend Robert Johnson is the pastor of Philadelphia's Tinley Temple United Methodist Church, named after the figure known as one of the founding fathers of gospel music. And let us be grateful for the gift of music which we have given The most exciting thing about being a congregation member here at Tinley is that you're actually connected to a piece of history. Living, breathing history that still is alive today. The organ, the Messiah. The whole mystique about the building. You're coming to a place that we build as African Americans. In the balcony, a dollar was given by every single member to purchase a chair. There's members here who still remember their mothers and fathers putting up a dollar to purchase one of the chairs in the balcony. Charles Tinley was self-educated and known for his powerful preaching. His congregation became one of the largest Methodist churches in the United States in the 1920s, with nearly 10,000 members. In 1927, the church took the name Tinley Temple. You'll see a congregation who, through the struggles and, and the adversities, exemplified the best of United Methodist culture and did the best that they could with what they had. It's a place that if you want to have a connection to what United Methodism really is in the African-American context, got to come to town. Reba Smith-Poole is a lifelong member who is proud of the many generations of preachers, doctors, and leaders from Tindley Temple. We are known for three things, good music, good preaching, and good food. We have some of the best preachers you ever want to hear. But whatever you do, enjoy yourself. We lose so much of our history and so much of who we are. And our generations to come need to understand that this belongs to you. I heard a kid sing uh, the other day, um, By and By. He had no idea that By and By was a Tenley hymn. When I told the young man and I brought him in here, and the first thing he said was, wow, I walk by it every day, and I never knew it was here. And people who don't understand their history really can't respect it, but when you understand it, you respect it, and you hold it a little bit closer to your heart. So we want to offer an opportunity for you to ask questions. If there are questions that you have, we invite you to offer them in the chat. Uh, we will integrate questions throughout the course of this conversation so that we don't end it with just the questions. So if you have questions about that brief history, kind of fast forward quickly, um, write your questions in the chat. This is a moment where we're going to talk about the then, and then the next segment of our conversation is about the now. And then we'll have another segment about the what's next. 
So were there questions or curiosities that emerged as you heard about that very fast history, a significant history related to Black contributions in the United Methodist, what we know as United Methodist construct right now? Yeah, so the question is emerged about what were some of the notable women in the early movement? And that's a great question because I had to do some very significant research to try to figure out who the women were. And unfortunately, I, did, I wasn't able to find notables related to Black women in the United Methodist movement. And that could be many things because you know, the one who has the hint, the pen has the power. <laughs> and so those were not necessarily chronicled. But we know that in those times, a large percentage of church goers were women. Um, and so we, we would have to assume, make the assumption that there were notable women who rallied together through bake sales and other means. I would also suggest they were very instrumental uh, in creating societies within communities to make sure that missions were uh, ensued and that children did not go hungry and that everyone was community in the village helping one another. And so I don't have those names of notable women, but that's something that I need to research even more because there were significant women in this movement, even those that were not even ordained at that time because the United Methodist Church as a whole did not uh, begin ordaining women until 1950-ish. Um, and then I believe that the first African-American female that was ordained was 1972. So this was after merger. And so that became, that, that, that's problematic <laughs> in so many ways, but that, that's a whole nother lecture. Um, the question was, was the first African-American bishop charged with overseeing all white congregations and when was the first cross-cultural appointment? Great question. So when the United Methodist Church came together and when uh, Bishop Nichols was elected, he was elected to a dominant cultured uh, uh, jurisdiction. And so he had the opportunity to serve uh, alongside the dominant culture for which many in the jurisdiction that was brand new for an African-American male to have that type of leadership uh, capabilities. And so I imagine as I was reading through just his courage to lead in those times, how there was massive disrespect. And again, this was 1968. So we're still in the hinge of Jim Crow and segregation. And so um, everyone wasn't happy to call him Bishop at all. <laughs> and so, um, and, and that has progressed through and we'll talk about who our bishops are kind of right now and when the first African-American female was elected after 1968. Um, and so it's interesting because in 2004, uh, the U General Conference of the United Methodist Church acknowledged the errors of its ways and did a service of reconciliation in a means of acknowledging the significant strands of racism, the acts of racism for its members and leadership. And that was in 2004. But my wondering throughout this whole experience of researching this even more about the then was the church was the escape, the refuge, the place where you wanted to go, not only to feel good, but to fellowship. And then also it was the place where you rallied together to begin thinking about how you were going to lend your voice and your feet to the political constructs that were happening at that time. And then to know that you're part of a dominant culture denomination, but which even when we say we're United Methodists, we don't act like we're united. And that is even today, and we'll talk more about that. But I just wonder, those Black persons who decided to stay, like in Mother Zor or even Tinley Temple, how did they continue to believe that this denomination was where they needed to be uh, 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 planted, and much less their continued commitment to knowing that they are in a dominant culture denomination that doesn't necessarily affirm them, but yet they were so focused on the cause of Jesus Christ that all of that didn't even matter. It's amazing. Any other questions about the then? And we're gonna talk about the now here uh, momentarily. 
Okay, so we're gonna keep it moving. Thank you. And so to think about the right now, Black people in the United Methodist Movement, kind of what does that look like right now? And my thing decided that it didn't want to work. So we're going to do something else. Hold on real quick. One sec. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Got to. Got to. All right, here we are. And so facts and figures about right now, and this information was taken from our General Board of Finance and Administration, effective 2017 was the earliest that we were able to get information, I mean, the latest, uh, because of the time lab lapse in how churches report and then how our General Board of Finance and Administration reports. So roughly at that time, the picture in time, 416,855 persons claim to be African-American persons are, are claiming United Methodists in the United States. Roughly, that equates to 6.278% of the total United Methodist membership. Roughly, there are 2,310 primarily African-American congregations. 2,310 primarily African-American congregations which equates to around 7% of the United Methodist congregations across the United States. As it relates to clergy, there are only 4.1% of African-American clergy, which are elders, deacons, those who are ordained, and also those who serve as local pastors. Interesting note is that before 1968, in those other arms of Methodist, the Methodist Protestant Church, the Methodist uh, Episcopal Church South, and uh, those uh, streams that created the United Methodist Church, there were 21 African-American bishops elected. But of that, majority of those were elected within the central jurisdictions. Since the merger in 1968, there have been 40 African-American bishops elected, and currently there are 11 actively serving in the United States. And the first African-American female elected was in 1984. We merged in 1968. The first was not ordained until around 1972. And the first African-American female was elected in 1984. Other facts and figures about the United Methodist Church, it's interesting to note that of the top 100 churches, there are these seven churches that are, are, are listed as the top 100 United Methodist churches in the US. There's Windsor Village in Houston, St. John's United Methodist Church in Houston, Ben Hill United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Cascade in Atlanta, Anderson in West Jackson, Mississippi, St. Luke's Community in Dallas, Texas, and uh, not Atlanta, Texas, it's Atlanta, Georgia, uh, St. James United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. I find it interesting that it was in the Methodist Episcopal South that they upheld the formation and the slavery. And then when it all came together, it's amazing that the seven top 100 United Methodist churches now reside in the Southern part of these United States of America. And these are among the top 100 United Methodist churches. So if you have opportunity to visit their websites or even uh, worship with them virtually, I would encourage them, uh, I would encourage that exploration because it's uh, quite phenomenal to be listed in the top 100 United Methodist churches in this, these United States of America. So for the next few moments, I really wanna talk about what continues to sustain the, Af the Black Methodist movement here in these United Methodist Church. And it's without these significant organizations, I do not feel that the advancement of Black persons contribution in the United Methodist Church would be able to be upheld. And as you heard in the organizing of the United Methodist Church in 1968, it was the Orient, it was the creation of what we know now as the Black Methodists for Church Renewal. The Black Methodists for Church Renewal, their mission is to raise up prophetic and spiritual leaders who will be advocates for the unique needs of Black people in the United Methodist Church. 
The vision for BMCR, because there's always an acronym for everything, is a renewed, transformed, unified body of Christ on mission in the world. To this day, the Black Methodist for Church Renewal has local chapters throughout the United States, and they continue to define and refine directions for themselves and this denomination that have brought respect, growth, and renewed commitment to God and God's purposes for the United Methodist Church. The BMCR continues to be a necessary force for change and accountability in the United Methodist Church. This change and accountability spills over and the benefits, and it benefits the church's global body. It's important to note that the BMCR has been significant in raising the consciousness of the United Methodist Church as it continues to wrestle with the tensions of racism and the tensions of not resourcing our primarily Black congregations for success and fruitfulness in these Americas. It's also interesting to note that the BMCR, Black Methodists for Church Renewal, it declares that we, the people called Black Methodists for Church Renewal, created in the image of God, confess our faith in a living and just God. We call ourselves and the uni entire United Methodist Church to repentance, to reveal God's church as a community of faith, to declare the traditions and stories of the Bible and Black culture, to reclaim the Black community and to liberate all people from racism and injustice everywhere. Again, there are chapters scattered throughout uh, the different uh, conferences in the United Methodist Church in the U United States, for which there are lay, non-clergy, and clergy persons committed to making sure that the United Methodist Church is called to repentance and rebuilding God's church as a faith community. And so if you are interested in the work of BMCR, I would encourage you to visit their website. Another significant tool and resource uh, is what is called strengthening the Black church for the 21st century. Again, with BMCR, that is, a, that is a, a caucus group within the United Methodist Church, primarily for African-American persons, to ensure that the consciousness of the church uh, is continued to focus on uh, race and being anti-racist and also ensuring that there is justice for all. The national plan known as the Strengthening the Black Church for the 21st Century is indeed a national plan of the United Methodist Church and it works directly with annual conferences, which is the gathering and the grouping of churches across the United States and abroad. This uh, SBC 21 also works with local churches and ministries to provide services. Um, these churches work in collaboration with one another to ensure that they are resource centers to develop leaders for black churches. And I think that is important to note because even as we have currently around 2,310 African-American churches, so oftentimes there is a gap in resources, be it financial and people resources to ensure that the ministry continues to be fruitful and faithful in the various communities for which we find our African-American churches. We understand that there are changing times and shifting communities and new technologies are often demanded more from local congregations. And so SBC 21 is helping to meet the ministry needs that are fast and growing. Churches are finding the need to gain new skills, particularly black churches, to gain new skills, try new approaches, and connect with others in collaborative and innovative ways. What I appreciate about SBC 21 is that they are intentional as a national plan of the United Methodist Church, which means in these areas, every United Methodist Church, be it Black, White, Hispanic, Korean, any anyone that claims themselves to be United Methodist, a portion of their giving to the general church goes and is poured into strengthening the black church for the 21st century. So I find it interesting and I praise God for it 
that at times when we find ourselves struggling, particularly those that are African-American persons struggling for resources, we know through the connection of the United Methodist Church that each and every church through their giving to the general church is pouring into SBC 21, if they like it or not. <laughs> These are some of the focus areas for strengthening the black church for the 21st century, ensuring that problem solving opportunities needing expert facilitation or true achieve resolution, visioning, strategic planning. And as you can see, uh, they also provide professional coaches that are deployed in our black churches to ensure that lay and clergy teams are growing together, working together and being able to see beyond themselves in a changing demographic. Additionally, there is another organization within the United Methodist Church that helps to continue to raise the consciousness for the United Methodist Church for all persons of color and primarily those that are of African-American descent. And that is called the General Commission on Religion and Race. In 1968, when the General Commission on Religion and Race was formed, uh, it was formed to hold the newly formed United Methodist Church accountable in its commitment to reject the sin of racism in every aspect of the life of the church. Today, when the forces of discrimination and oppression are once again ascended, those dedicated to the work of justice look to GCOR, because again, there's an acronym for everything, to champion the possibilities of a new unity arising from our divisions and the fulfillment of God's intention that we work and thrive together amidst forces that seek to tear us apart. Now in the movement, when we must claim our inherent rights as human beings to love, justice, wholeness, and peace, and to affirm that all people share in this right as a, ch as a child of God. And so for our churches to truly be a sanctuary, we must utterly unshakable in our commitment that all people are equally worthy of belonging and love. And this is coming from the General Commission on Religion and Race. They will not rest until its work of challenging and equipping the church, the United Methodist Church, to complete its unfinished agenda of dismantling racial discrimination. And this is significant because any time that there is a matter to arise related to racism, so oftentimes our general commission on religion and race is the first voice that we will hear, along with our bishops. But the General Commission on Religion and Race, again, is another opportunity for which the connection, people like it or not, are investing because of their giving to uh, the apportionment, the general church apportionment. They are investing in the General Commission on Religion and Race. And this General Commission was birthed from the 1968 merger of the United Methodist Church to ensure that there is accountability for the church for all persons. The purpose of religion and race shall be to challenge, lead, and equip the people of the United Methodist Church to become interculturally competent, to ensure institutional equity, and to facilitate vital conversations around and about religion, race, and culture. And I wanna say a little bit more about the General Commission on Religion and Race. Because in these United Methodist, uh, in the United States, particularly in the United Methodist Church, there is what we call cross-racial, cross-cultural appointments. And so oftentimes we have Black pastors serving in dominant culture congregations, for which when we fail to prepare those congregations for their leadership, it is at the demise of the clergy person and at the failure for truly understanding God's call and the cause of Jesus Christ. One of the beauties of the General Commission on Religion and Race is that they provide resources for superintendents and congregations to be in these vital conversations about how to welcome the other into leadership, but more importantly, how to welcome other in changing demographics around churches for which there is no dominant culture. One of the things that I appreciate as I serve as a district superintendent is utilizing the resources from the General Commission on Religion and Race 
as I have the opportunity of placing pastors or presenting pastors into cross-racial, cross-cultural appointments. I remember a time uh, about three years ago when one of our African-American pastors was being uh, presented to a all white congregation for which they have never had that type of leadership. And so the first question that I ask is, is this gonna be a problem? And of course, everyone says, no, that's not gonna be a problem. We love everyone. One of the things that I had to remind them is that when I walked in the door, they didn't see my badge that said superintendent and they treated me as if I was the help. And so I had to remind them just 15 minutes before the meeting started, many of them passed by me, overlooked me, didn't even see or acknowledge me, but yet I am presenting you with a pastor that is of African-American descent and yet you say you welcome all persons. And so of course there was red face and many embarrassments and apologies, but that accountability opened the door for conversation. And we used one of the resources for the, from the General Commission on Religion and Race to ensure that they are in constant conversation around this matter of respecting the other's leadership, but also working together with the other. What we have found also is that sometimes in our dominant cultured society congregations, they are very quick to send money out or even allow people in, allow, and I said that word, allow people in to use their facilities, their gyms and all of that. But we miss and they miss oftentimes the opportunity of making connection, to build relationship, to make assumptions about, oh, we just know that they need peanut butter sandwiches. When in, in fact, how do you start creating societies of people who understand their financial uh, limitations, but then unleashing the possibilities of their giftings? And that's the beauty of the General Commission on Religion and Race. And I continue to hone in on that because without the General Commission on the Religion and Race, I really don't know how African-American contributions to the United Methodist Church would, be able, would, would have been able to sustain and much less sustain even in 2021. So let's keep going. This is fun. Let's go. All right. So. One of the things, uh, another point of contribution for the United Methodist Church that I find is very significant is that all United Methodist churches, if they like it or not, are contributing to what is called the Black College Fund. And the Black College Fund was established in 1972 where the United Methodist Church provided a constant and reliable way to support United Methodist related historically black colleges and universities. And today the United Methodist Church uh, supports more historically black colleges and universities than any other religious denomination. These 11 institutions play an indispensable role in shaping diverse young leaders for the church and the world. United Methodist colleges and universities, black colleges and universities offer a chance to everyone with a dream and a commitment to excel regardless of race, class, gender, or ethnic heritage. They also extend important educational opportunities to countless underserved and first generation college students who might not be able to pursue a degree otherwise despite their talents, skills, and passions. The Black College Fund is a United Methodist fund that all congregations pour into because of their giving and is raising up leaders who are impacting lives and shaping communities. So these 11 institutions are United Methodist related and because of the Black College Fund, they are able to be supported by congregations in the rural part of Indiana, unbeknownst to that congregation, but these, uh, institutions are being supported worldwide in order for there to be black leaders, both equipped, trained and skilled to be deployed into the world for further advancement and for service. So that is a point of celebration that I do appreciate about the United Methodist Church and the continued, uh, continued contributions 
that we have as black persons in these Americas. So this is another opportunity where you are able to put your questions in the chat and there are a couple of questions that I will raise. Yeah, the question about the split of the United Methodist Church, how will it impact United Methodist, Black United Methodists? And what percentage do I believe will go to the conservatives? Um, so we're gonna put a pause on that question because I'm gonna talk about it at the end. I, I am, I, I definitely am because I knew that was gonna come. Are there any other questions related to the now, the facts and the figures? You saw the top 100 churches, you saw the demographics about how roughly 6% of the United Methodist membership is African-American, roughly 7% are African-American, primarily African-American churches. Are there other questions related to, and the bishops, are there other questions related to that? All right, Chris, you say there is a few questions in the Q&A box. Oh, okay. So we're going to talk about the pro the question was, um, how do you think the money set aside for persons of color in the protocol will be or should be used? Great question. We'll talk about that at the end as well. And how would you describe the relationship between African Americans among the Pan Methodist churches? Are United Methodists welcome? Great question. I believe that there is a growing uh, relationship. Perhaps there needs to be more intentionality around this pan-Methodist uh, collaboration. I know that in our understanding of receiving and sending pastors between the, the various denominations, the pan-Methodist denominations, um, that there is a growing understanding that we share in the same doctrine and understanding. And so there's not a lot that persons coming primarily from like CME or AME and AME Zion will have to integrate into the United Methodist Church but I think that that is a low hanging fruit opportunity uh, that the United Methodist Church could take ownership of to ensure and nurture uh, the Pan Methodist, particularly the Black Pan Methodist uh, relationships for the recruitment and also for the planting of new faith communities. And we're gonna talk about the protocol. We're gonna talk about the upcoming United Methodist potential uh, split. Uh, we're going to talk about that at the end. And I'm going to keep going because Chris is going to cut me off here shortly. So I want to talk about the United Methodist Church and the movement about what's next. Um, we're going to talk, but one of the things I want to talk about is that Black people in the United Methodist movement also incorporates the expanse and growth of the membership on the continent of Africa. And I would be dismissed if we did not talk about that part of it, because it's roughly estimated that 4.7 million United Methodists are on the continent of Africa. And that equates to about 3.8% of the continent's population as a whole. And that is a growing demographic. It is expanding and it is growing. The gospel message through the United Methodist witness is growing and expanding on the continent of Africa. What I find interesting is that the uh, United Methodist Church in Africa is growing rapidly and is transforming the presence in the countries on the continent. And it's being influential, influential beyond its numbers, engaging in the holistic Wesleyan ministry of outreach, evangelism, and humanitarianism. The church in Africa is part of a civil society and has a strong witness to make in participating in community development in promoting conflict resolution, res reconciliation, and justice ministries. It's interesting to note that oftentimes the United Methodist Church on the continent of Africa, the United Methodist Churches on the continent of Africa have been the forerunners in the public health and disease prevention, including the bouts with malaria, HIV AIDS, and most currently Ebola, and we're there now through all of this COVID. Uh, the church in the United States and Europe has played a strong role in, in advocating respect for the rights of African governments and peoples to define their economic policies and priorities for the continuing support. Um, and it's interesting to note that, again, through the United Methodist contributions, all churches 
as they give to the global church uh, through their general apportionments, they are supporting the expanded ministry throughout the continent of Africa. So I would be remiss if I did not talk about Black people and their contributions even now throughout the continent. One of the beautiful things that we have as a result of the continued commitment uh, on the continent of Africa is what is called Africa, Uni Africa University. Africa University is a private Pan-African and United Methodist related institution. It has more than 1,200 students from 36 African countries and it's located in Matare, Zimbabwe, which is the fourth largest city. Uh, it grants bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in various programs. And in 1988, the General Conference, which is again, the decision-making body of the United Methodist Church, unanimously approved the founding of Africa University and made a commitment to provide financial support for the university from the general budget, which is roughly about 2.5 million US dollars annually. So every church, no matter what their break makeup is, that gives to the general church apportionment is supporting uh, Africa University because it's a United Methodist related institution and it is pouring into the lives of over 1,200 students annually, annually, to make a difference throughout the continent of Africa. And here is a short video that I really would hope that you hear about Africa University. Africa, it is the second largest continent on the planet and home to 54 nations. Africa is a place of contrasts, birthplace of the world's oldest civilizations and the world's youngest country. A region emerging with fast-growing modern economies, but still plagued in many places by famine, disease and violence. As globalization brings Africa to our doorstep, how is it possible to fulfill the great commandment and care for our neighbors as ourselves in a peaceful world? Welcome to Africa University the first private university in Zimbabwe. 1,500 students from 29 nations attend this United Methodist institution. For many, this campus is a remarkable contrast to their home countries. Africa University is a place of peace, learning, and hope. A university facing Africa's challenges and finding solutions by shaping a new leadership for the continent. From the moment you enter the campus of Africa University, you immediately sense that something is different and special here. In many ways, Africa University looks and feels like any other United Methodist College campus. What is different is the dozens of languages and cultures melding in classrooms and across campus. I've never been in a place where there's so many people from so many countries and you get to interact with them and you learn their languages and you understand their cultures as well. These gifted students, representing a wide range of cultural and economic backgrounds, receive superb higher educations combined with moral, ethical and spiritual development. The product that comes out once you graduate is not someone who has got a career, but more of a leader who is able to go home to their respective country and actually implement uh, what they've learned, and not as someone who is following the trends, but someone who is actually setting the trends. Established by the United Methodist Church in 1992, Africa University is the fulfillment of the vision of a United Methodist missionary who felt God's call to evangelize and provide education to African people and acquired the land for that purpose more than a hundred years ago. The need is clear and the formula is simple. Bring higher learning to the people of Africa and watch as the fruits of peace and education multiply when graduates return home to transform lives in their own countries. Alumni of AU bring with them world-class higher education with degrees in agriculture and natural resources, humanities and social sciences, education, health sciences, theology, management and administration, and peace leadership and governance. AU alumni have gone on to important leadership roles in government, law, medicine, business, science, education, and the church all over the continent. So, you know, my country is going through challenges 
wars. So the reason why I'm doing this degree is to promote peace in my country and also to help my church. Church is not about only preaching the gospel. So the church has to do uh, many things. The church has a role to play to promote peace, to promote good governance. And you should know that the church is also part of the civil society. More than half of the 1.1 billion people living on the African continent are younger than 19 years of age. The United Methodist Church has created a place to nurture these young people so that they can become peaceful, principled leaders on the continent of Africa. Now that I'm going to go back as a politician, which is less in Uganda, it's going to have a great impact in Uganda because I'm going to be a great leader. Yes, and that's what I'm going to take back and I'm going to make an impact on my country. As a connected church family, we can help transform the world, one leader at a time. In doing so, we also live out our faith and deepen our relationship with God. Your prayers, your gifts, your commitment to Africa University will assure that our world will be a better place, one leader at a time. So again, I would be remiss if I didn't share about Africa University, because again, I believe that that is one of the growing and expanding ministries that is continuing to contribute to the African American and also the Black construct of the contributions to the United Methodist Church. And so in our concluding time together, I wanna to talk about uh, Black people in the Methodist movement, what's next? There is a growing concern within many churches, particularly Black churches, related to our upcoming decision as a United Methodist Church. For those who are unfamiliar and unaware that the United Methodist Church has been on an ongoing battle, but much, much recently more illuminated around this matter of human sexuality. And currently we have a postpone, postpone uh, general conference that will convene in August of 22, 2022, for which a decision will be made related to um, this matter of human sexuality, but other matters in and of itself. And the question remains, well, what happens to the Black church? So oftentimes it is the Black church that is not thought of highly and much less resourced within the United Methodist movement. And there is a growing percentage, statistics are showing, that uh, Black people are finding themselves in dominant cultured congregations, meaning that they tend and often want to worship in uh, dominant cultured congregations. So what does that mean for the black church? The questions of wrestling comes to and about the relevancy of the black church. So how can the black church become revived and relevant to the communities for which it serves, but also continue to reach a growing demographic, growing demographic of persons who are wa not wanting anything to do with the church? And then to know that this church is associated with a growing debate related to this matter of human sexuality, that doesn't create a good billboard for recruitment <laughs> or even discipleship in my opinion. And so there is many questions regarding the relevancy of the black church in 2021 and beyond. Also around the recruitment of clergy, black clergy particularly, uh, uh, who will be able to serve in 2021 and beyond. To become a United Methodist elder ordained, it requires significant investment of time and financial resources. And so oftentimes that becomes a barrier for the continuation of African-American leadership in the United Methodist Church. Because so oftentimes people see the, the, the long process and get discouraged by it. I would also suggest that there is a growing concern uh, around how do we begin really looking at the communities that some of our Black churches are in, filled with oftentimes dilapidated buildings, drug infestation and addictions. How do we can begin intentionally in investing in the Black church? so that the black church can continue to do what it's been known for, and particularly in the United Methodist Church, 
when we have so many resources across the dominant culture denomination, and yet we're failing to invest in some of the critical areas uh, dealing with African-American persons. And so the what's next, it's many questions and many wrestlings. The question about how many do, how many black churches do I feel would move to a new expression of Methodism? Um, that's an ongoing conversation that I'm having with many black churches here in Indiana and up beyond, um, particularly as it relates to this matter of human sexuality. Unfortunately, some of our churches have not even informed their congregants about the potential split of the United Methodist Church. And as it relates to the matter of human sexuality, that's not a conversation that is often had. So there is growing concern that we are creating a demise of the continuation of the Black contribution in United Methodism because people are not seeing the relevance. And so that's a concern. And so the question was asked about, you know, with the protocol of separation and reconciliation, separation, grace and separation, excuse me, um, how much money do I feel needs to be set aside for persons of color? I believe that there should be a percentage knowing that in this protocol, there are funds allocated to emerging expressions of United Methodists, but there has to be some intentionality about investing in uh, national plans such as SBC 21 that cannot be dismissed or set aside, as well as the other uh, national plans around uh, Hispanic and Latinx ministry, as far as Asian and Korean ministry, there has to be some intentionality. And I would so boldly declare and ask that at least 10% of the cumulative resources are invested in these national plans so that however the dust settles, these national plans will not be dismissed and the work can continue because ultimately the ministry will continue. We just need to continue to invest in it. And so I invite you again to offer your questions in the chat. Uh, if there are questions and in our concluding time, the question always is asked of me, why do I remain United Methodist? I became United Methodist as a result of an invitation to a United Methodist Church in Duncanville, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, Texas. It was in this United Methodist Church that I found community and I found family. It was in the United Methodist Church that I first experienced a female in pastoral leadership because I didn't think women could do that. <laughs> it was in this Black United Methodist Church in Duncanville, Texas, that I was able to truly experience uh, this understanding of grace like never before, which is foundational in our theology. I was able to experience the shared leadership of clergy and non-clergy leaders coming together for the cause of Jesus Christ, which is pinnacle to our polity as United Methodists. And I was able to see that Black persons were made, able to make major contributions and impact in a dominant culture denomination, which I had never experienced before. And so I continue to remain United Methodist and will continue to avail myself in service to this church because I believe firmly in our theology of grace and our understanding of welcome. I affirm strongly the shared leadership of lay and clergy alike in the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ. And I am celebrating the connection, the collaboration of all United Methodist churches, being able to invest in places like Africa University and our 11 historically black colleges and universities that are United Methodist related, and that continue to invest in the strengthening the black church of the 21st century and continues to invest in the General Commission on Religion and Race and continues to invest in uh, the black Methodist for church renewal. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I think that onwards to perfection, which is Wesleyan language, the onus is on those that are in it, not for someone else. And so that's why I continue to remain United Methodist and hope that my uh, uh, 
uh, availing in service will be a part of continued history. It's unfortunate that even in 2021, there are still several firsts, um, first elected, uh, not elected, appointed uh, district superintendents we have in some areas where they have never had a district superintendent that is of African-American descent. And there are many annual conferences that are experiencing the first female, uh, African-American female in these positions of leadership. There are several churches and dominant uh, cultured uh, congregations that have told me specifically that they would welcome a woman, but a person of color, they don't know if they're ready for that yet. And so there is a lot of work that needs to be done and we need more African-American persons coming together rallying for the cause of not just the United Methodist Church, but continued Black contributions for the ongoing of the United Methodist Church. There was a question in the chat, um, what impact have African Methodists had on the question of sexualities or relationship between Black United Methodist leadership and African leadership? Great question. There, it's interesting because in 2019, before the whole COVID thing, uh, there was a group of us uh, African-American females that met on the continent of Africa, actually at Africa University. And we met with some uh, the leaders of some of the annual conferences over the, it, on the continent. And the question was asked, did you know that in the US, the dominant narrative is that the Africans are going to be the demise of the United Methodist Church around this area of human sexuality. And for many of them, they had never heard that narrative, which is unfortunate. And it's unfortunate that we here in these United States are carrying that narrative to blame the demise or the, excuse me, the upcoming split of the United Methodist Church on those faithful persons that are serving in an expanding and growing ministry on the continent of Africa. So we began delving deeper into this understanding of human sexuality. And for some of them that were represented there, it was around 30, uh, that across the continent, we met in Zimbabwe, Montari, Zimbabwe. They were familiar with uh, this understanding of the LGBTQIA community. They stated that many in their tribes and communities uh, identified with the LGBTQIA community, but they loved them anyway. And so I get, uh, Satin, when the narrative is that all Africans do not affirm the LGBTQIA community, because I don't believe that that's absolute truth. I do understand that in some cultures, uh, to identify LGBTQIA could mean death in other means. I, I understand that in some cultures that it, it would mean isolation, shame, and other uh, aspects of their personhood not being uplifted or considered of sacred worth. I get that. But I would suggest that as African Methodists that serve and are serving as United Methodists on the continent of Africa, I would have to make a bold claim that not all of them are wanting to leave the United Methodist Church and that many of them have come to know Christ because of the United Methodist Church. And so there is significant work that needs to be done with the black leadership and the African leadership so that we can continue to be in further conversation around the truth of the matter. And then there has to be this understanding of, for some, the resourcing, financial resourcing often creates the votes, sad to say. And so those that are on the continent, the resources are not in abundance. And so oftentimes there are those that invest in their ministries and then also have their ear for how best to vote. And that's sad. That's colonization all over again. And I would hope that as we move forward as a church, whatever that looks like, that we are not continuing to perpetuate colonization, racism, injustices, simply because we wanna promote a position, whatever that may be. So there needs to be more work. There needs to be more conversation. There needs to be more truth telling regarding this matter. The United Methodist Church is facing a very difficult decision. 
one that is long overdue. But what I know to be true about those who are of African-American Black United Methodists, they have overcome so much, even with the merger of 1968 and before then. And they continue to stand faithfully, faithfully declaring Jesus is Lord. And so that's what we have to hold our head up high and ground our feet in, knowing that it's for the cause of Jesus Christ. And I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. If there are other questions, we'll entertain those. And if not, then I will turn this back over to Chris, I believe. Yes, indeed. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fulbright. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, you have one more question uh, in the chat. Do you see it? I what do. Is your, what is my hope? Yeah, thank you. What is my hope for Black Methodists moving forward? That we understand that we are not in competition, that we are in connection with one another that we need to learn better how to pool our resources so that we can ensure that our institutions, meaning our congregations are not in demise and um, that the legacies of those that were so faithful from before will continue beyond even us. Um, other hopes of Black Methodists uh, moving forward is that we need to raise our voice and our presence and get engaged in the United Methodist understanding so that we are not left to the side or getting the sound bites and not informed regarding some important decisions that need to be made. My hope for the uh, Black United Methodists is to continue to elevate the good that we are doing, the impact that we are having, because people need to hear those stories. And so often that those stories are silenced and that we should not be afraid regarding the injustices that continue to happen in this United Methodist Church and continue to raise the consciousness and offer the accountability for how we truly will be united, period. I have another question that's coming to you right now, Dr. Fulbright, can you hear me? What work, yes, is, being, what work is being done with other racial ethnic caucuses in uh, the United Methodist Church right now uh, as, as you all prepare for this big decision in 2022? Yeah, so um, as I shared that there are many other national plans, Latinx, uh, Asian Korean, uh, Pacific Islander. Um, so there are a host of other persons of color who serve as United Methodists that from a general church perspective have been in conversation to ensure that there is adequate information and also to ensure that they, all of us, do not get left aside whenever the dust settles. So there is a, a caucus group of persons of color of these national plans that regularly meet together to ensure that their particular arms and uh, arms of the United Methodist movement continues to remain uh, vigilant and informed regarding these matters. So that's intentionally happening from the from the uh, general church perspective. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to remind uh, for those attending tonight. First, uh, of course, thank you for joining us. But we have a couple of more Edwards lectures coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Our next one will be April twelfth. Uh, Reverend Dr. Douglas Clark, who's a visiting professor here at Louisville Seminary, will talk about the history of the Black Presbyterian tradition. And on April 26th, uh, Reverend Dr. Teresa L. Fry Brown, uh, she will present the Church of Allen, Tending Our Own Vine and Fig Tree. And if you look in the chat, uh, I, include information, I included information about both of those upcoming lectures, as well as links to register. Um, as with this one, uh, the event is free. Uh, it will be recorded, and uh, we'd love to see you. Uh, we'd love to see you there as well. Um, without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Kauser to offer some concluding remarks. Dr. Fulbright, this was an outstanding presentation. Thank you for uh, taking up the full span of 
of life uh, for Black uh, United Methodists from the 1600s up until now, and well into the early 20th, 21st century, uh, for taking the time to include uh, visuals and uh, films, especially Africa University. Uh, what an outstanding witness on, on the, in the motherland uh, to Methodism and to, and to uh, the value of higher education. We want to thank you again for, for the work that you've done and for your relationship with Louisville Seminary and hope that, that we can continue to work with you uh, as we continue to do our work to lift up Black church and Black religion more broadly in this country and around the world. Thank you. Let us pray, church. For Dr. Fulbright, for all Black United Methodists in this country and around the world, we give you thanks for their witness, for Roy Nichols, for the early work of Woody White, for Mother Zoar and her persistent and prophetic witness in these states, for Tenley United Methodist Church and the prophetic liberating music that came from Mr. Tenley that works to liberate people even today throughout this world who live with their backs against the wall. For all of the unnamed faithful women saints of the church whose names are buried in history but who are known to the saints and to our Lord and are celebrated in glory. We thank you for their witness. For Black Methodists, for Church Renewal, for G Corps, for the Black College Front and the innumerable students who have been educated and gone on to rich full lives because of the education that they have received. And for the men and women at Africa University who are transforming the continent uh, for peace, for justice, for education, for good government. We give you thanks, oh God, for all of these gifts, but mostly that this church is called in season and out, in the morning and as we lay our heads down at night to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the whole world. We thank you for that audacious, faithful call and for all who labor in this vineyard to fulfill it. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the glory of the Holy Spirit, and for the power of the God that we serve this day and forever. Amen. Thank you, church. We will see you, Dr. Fulbright. We will see you again. Bless you so much for your outstanding work and presentation. <laughs>